This is Dr. Jan Basil, professor of medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina and at the Ralph H. Johnson VA Medical Center in Charleston, South Carolina. And today I'd like to talk to you about the update of the most recent 2017 American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guideline on hypertension. Here are my disclosures. Here are the objectives. At the conclusion of the presentation, I'd like you to be familiar with the 2017 ACC AHA hypertension guideline, new definition of hypertension, and how it changes the US population at risk for hypertension, to recognize how to properly take blood pressure and the importance of an accurate blood pressure measurement, to recognize when to implement lifestyle modification in the treatment of hypertension, to be familiar with the current first-line agents for the treatment of hypertension, and to recognize what blood pressure goal or target is recommended to best improve cardiovascular outcome in specific patient populations with hypertension. We have been developing hypertension guidelines since 1977. It all began in 1972 when Elliot Richardson, who was the Secretary of Education, put together the National High Blood Pressure Education Program. Five years later, the first Joint National Committee was put together. And about every several years, up to 2003, <coughs> we had a JNC report. Now, we were supposed to have another JNC-8 in 2017, 2016. This group was assembled, but the National Institute of Health, National Heart Lung Blood Institute, decided that they didn't want to be in the guideline business anymore. So the JNC-8 was never officially um, reported, although the organizers of the JNC-8 did put out a paper in JAMA. When the NHLBI got out of the guideline business, we ended with the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association taking over these guidelines. And that is the report that I'm presenting to you today, which was presented in November 2017. So in essence, it's really been 14 years since the last National Heart Lung Blood Institute guideline has been given to us. Now, this guideline, as opposed to previous guidelines, was only endorsed by 11 groups, including the ACC and the AHA. Notably missing from the guideline endorsement is the American College of Physicians and the American Academy of Family Physicians. This guideline was 116 pages long with 106 recommendations. 448 supporting data tables, and almost 1,000 references. And I'll try to key up on the major points um, of this guideline in the presentation. As always, they use a class or strength of recommenda recommendation and a level or quality of the evidence. And you may want to refer back to this slide as we go through some of the recommendations. It's important to remember that this guideline is not a commandment. It is a resource and a guide. It is a roadmap. It basically um, is trying to help you in your judgment, which remains most important in making decisions about your patient. No one knows your patient as well as you do, and you should use whatever blood pressure target and approve whatever you think is best for your patient and take this into account. But I will try to present the evidence as the committee saw it as they presented the guideline. So let's start out first with the epidemiology and the new classification of blood pressure. As you may remember from this classic slide of over 1 million adults by Sarah Lewington, Stroke death and ischemic heart disease death, left and right respectively on this slide, begins at blood pressures of 115 systolic over 75 diastolic. And for every 20 over 10 elevation in blood pressure, 
from 115 to 135, 75 to 85, there is a doubling of both stroke and ischemic heart disease risk. You'll notice that age has a tremendous importance on risk. The younger you are, the lower your risk. The older you are, the greater your risk. And you'll notice that the slope of the line is greater for stroke than it is for ischemic heart disease as blood pressure is more directly related to stroke and heart failure than it is to ischemic heart disease, but it clearly is related to both. The other thing we've learned is that what we've told people in the past, which was that normal blood pressure or optimal blood pressure at less than 120 over less than 80, and what we called normal or high normal blood pressure, and you see them in the box there, were nothing at all what we called them. In fact, both in men and women from the Framingham Heart Study, you can see that what we used to call normal at 120 to 129 over 80 to 84 and high normal at 130 to 139 over 85 to 89 was associated with an increased risk for cardiovascular events, including cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, and heart failure. So these blood pressures, less than 140 over less than 90, both normal and high normal, were associated with increased cardiovascular risk. And in this, meta, several meta-analyses have reported a gradient of progressively higher cardiovascular risk, going from a normal or optimal blood pressure of less than 120 over 80 to both normal and high normal blood pressures. And as you can see here, there's a significant, almost twofold increased risk of stroke and twofold risk of MI in those that have blood pressures less than 140 over less than 90, what we used to call high normal blood pressure. This led the committee with a class of recommendation one, which was the strongest benefit much greater than risk, and a BNR, which is a moderate quality evidence from at least one or more well-designed, executed, non-randomized, observational or registry studies or meta-analyses that blood pressure should be categorized as normal, elevated, or stage one or stage two hypertension to prevent and treat high blood pressure. So here are the new categories of blood pressure in adults. Normal is less than 120 and less than 80. Elevated is 120 to 129 and less than 80. And now we have stage one hypertension, 130 to 139 or 80 to 89, and stage two hypertension, 140 or 90 or greater. We no longer have stage three or stage four hypertension, which we abandoned many years ago. Importantly, when we say what the blood pressure is, we're basing this on an average of at least two or more careful readings obtained on two or more occasions. Now let's compare the 2003 blood pressure classification from JNC7 and the 2017 ACC AHA guideline we're presenting today. You can see that we no longer have prehypertension. There's nothing about these blood pressures that are prehypertensive. We now have the same normal blood pressure at less than 120 and less than 80. But now we have elevated blood pressure at 120 to 129 and less than 80, and stage one and stage two hypertension. Stage one hypertension replacing the higher prehypertension at 130 to 139 or 80 to 89. And stage two hypertension, as I mentioned, anything at 140 or 90 or greater. Now, what does this mean to our patient population? Well, on the far right is the JNC7 blood pressure of 140 over 90 or patients reporting that they're on antihypertensive medication. And on the left is the new 2017 ACC AHA guideline. And you can see that the overall prevalence of hypertension based on the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey of 2011 to 2014, suggests that there will be a 14% increase in the prevalence of hypertension. 
Importantly, in those less than 45 years of age, women will have a doubling of their hypertension. Men will have almost a tripling of their hypertension. And older patients, 65 to 74, will go from about two out of every three being hypertensive to now three out of every four being hypertensive. What does this mean for the overall prevalence of hypertension? Well, overall, there'll be about a 14% increase or 31 million more individuals with hypertension. But importantly, only about 2% or 4.2 million will be recommended for new pharmacologic treatment. But since we're lowering the, the goal or the target, an additional 14.4% or 7.9 million will need more antihypertensive therapy added to their regimen to get from the previous target of less than 140 over less than 90 to less than 130 over less than 80. So overall, we're saying there'll be about a 16% increase in the prevalence of those that are needing more or new blood pressure medication. So let me summarize what this means to the primary care clinician. At a threshold of 130 over 80 or greater, there'll be more patients diagnosed with hypertension. And this addition appears to triple the number of men and double the number of women 20 to 44 years old with hypertension. It is projected, however, based on risk that under the new guideline, only about 2% more patients will require new drug therapy, but an additional 14% of patients already treated will require additional drug therapy. Now let's shift and talk about the importance of the measurement of blood pressure. And Norm Kaplan, one of the leaders in hypertension, said several years ago, the measurement of blood pressure is likely the clinical procedure of greatest importance that is performed in the sloppiest manner. And the guideline with a class one recommendation based on expert opinion states for diagnosis and management of high blood pressure, proper methods are recommended for accurate measurement and documentation of blood pressure. Everything about this cartoon is wrong. First, the clinician is saying, I'm going to take your blood pressure, so try to relax and not think about what a high reading might mean for your chances of living a long, healthy life. You shouldn't be talking to the patient, and everything I'm showing you will elevate the blood pressure. The sphygmomanometer reading is on the wall, encouraging the patient to be on a table. She is startled. Her feet are off the floor. She's pushing off on the table, and her cuff size is too narrow. All of these things can be additive in getting a falsely elevated blood pressure leading you to do things in the treatment of your patient that may not be based on an accurate blood pressure. In fact, we believe that patients should be encouraged to arrive 15 minutes before their appointment. And importantly, you need to instruct the patient to avoid caffeine, exercise, and smoking for at least 30 minutes before their visit. The patient should be relaxed, they should be sitting in a chair, feet on the floor with back supported for at least five minutes. And many of the oscillometric automated devices, when you push the button, wait five minutes before blood pressure is taken. You want to ensure that the patient has emptied his or her bladder. And if you're a hospitalist and you're taking blood pressures or call to the floor to see a patient with an elevated blood pressure who's been admitted to the hospital, perhaps their bladder is full. And that's one of the reasons why they may have an increased blood pressure on the ward or in the hospital. Neither the patient or the observer should talk during the rest period and measurement. Often they're doing medication reconciliation or asking you your pain score while the cuff is being inflated, and this will lead to an increased blood pressure. You want to remove all clothing covering the area where the cuff is placed. <clears throat> this can lead up to a 20 millimeter increase in false blood pressure elevation. Use the correct cuff size at the level of the heart determined by the mid-arm circumference and support the patient's arm. 
use a blood pressure measurement device that has been validated and ensure that the device is calibrated periodically. Both an automated oscillometric device and the use of the auscultatory technique with a stethoscope and aneroid sphygmomanometer are acceptable, but I prefer an automated oscillometric device. And separate repeated measurements at least one minute apart and averaging at least two measurements are stated to be necessary. I prefer three measurements at each seating. Now this is a study almost 25 years old and it talks about adherence with proper blood pressure measurement. And you can see that to follow all the guidelines that are given at that time, 0% of patients were following all the guidelines, all, all their clinicians were following all the guidelines for adherence to proper auscultatory measurement. And you can see that each measurement error can contribute to quite an increased risk for elevating the seeming blood pressure when actually the blood pressure in the patient is actually not quite as high. So we like an automated office blood pressure or a cilometric monitor. This is one of the ways of measuring blood pressure in the guideline, although the auscultatory technique is still um, recommended. This gives you an upper arm reading. It has a button that counts down five minutes before the first measurements. It gives three automated sequential stored readings taken one minute apart. It also has a hide function so the patient cannot see the blood pressures as they're being measured so that that reduces any anxiety of the patient should the blood pressure be high. It averages out the three readings. It can be performed unattended or attended. It's not as important if there's an attendant in the room. We just don't want anyone talking, conversing, or challenging the patient with any other um, questions at the time their blood pressure is being measured. And this type of measurement device was used in both the SPRINT and ACCORD trials. Now measuring the blood pressure can really have differences in blood pressure um, measurement depending on the setting that you're taking the blood pressure in. And these studies look at the quality issues with manual blood pressure in practice suggesting that ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring is necessary to confirm the accuracy of blood pressure and to rule out white coat hypertension. Blood pressures were first taken in these trials by their personal physician. Then they were sent to a quality office the same day using mercury, which is no longer available, but at one time was the standard of measurement. And the same day, they are sent for an automated oscillometric measurement using the BP True Canadian device. And then they are given a 24 hour ambulatory measurement, and we're looking at the 24 hour awake blood pressure. You can see in the study by Martin Myers and 309 individuals that the blood pressure by the personal physician. May, may be more comparable to the research quality blood pressure, but notice the automated blood pressure of 132 over 75 is very similar to the awake 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure, but is 20 millimeters lower than the blood pressure that was taken by the personal physician using the auscultatory method. So one of the clinical pearls is don't be in a rush to label someone hypertensive. The new 2017 U.S. guideline recommends office blood pressure measurement solely as a screening measurement for the diagnosis of hypertension. And out-of-office blood pressure measurement, be it by ambulatory, 24-hour, or home measurement, be used as a diagnostic method to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension. We must make sure that patients are taught, ha, taught how to properly take their blood pressure at home. And this is just a picture of what we need to be conversing with our patient. They need to take their blood pressure using a, scult, a, an, a cilometric device in a quiet room with no talking, their back supported, 
feet on the floor in a chair, their arm is sleeveless and at heart level, and their feet are flat on the ground. And there are many blood pressure monitors which the patient should bring into the office so the clinician and the office staff can see what they're using and how they're taking their blood pressure in front of us so we know that they're taking proper home blood pressure measurements. I don't recommend any particular blood pressure device, but certainly these are reasonably priced anywhere from about $30 to $70, and they can be obtained at any drugstore or Sam's, Costco, um, and, and stores like that. In the future, patients will be using home devices that are automatically set up to register their measurements on their iPhone or their Droid, and that will be sent to their EMR. And in the future, HEDIS will accept these measurements, but this is probably several years away from being used at the present time. So in summary, out-of-office blood pressure measurements with a class one level of evidence A based on a systematic review, out-of-office blood pressure measurements are recommended to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension and for titration of blood pressure lowering medication in conjunction with telehealth counseling or clinical interventions. Now in a paper that was written this past year in hypertension, let me summarize about blood pressure measurement and the diagnosis of hypertension. They stated office blood pressure measurement is an imprecise screening method for diagnosing hypertension and therefore requires confirmation by out of office blood pressure evaluation. Validated electronic devices which automatically take triplicate blood pressure measurements and calculate the average are preferred so as to provide a more standardized evaluation of office blood pressure. Ambulatory blood pressure use, where necessary, should be encouraged by appropriate reimbursement and should be made more widely available to patients. Home blood pressure measurement is useful for long-term follow-up of treated hypertension and can improve blood pressure control rates. All right, let's move on now to the patient evaluation. This is not a new recommendation. We've been recommending for many years now in terms of the basic and optional laboratory test for the diagnosis of hypertension that patients should get a metabolic, basic metabolic profile with a fasting blood glucose, a CBC for overall general health, a lipid profile for cardiovascular risk, a serum creatinine and estimated GFR, for renal function, a serum sodium, potassium, and calcium to look for secondary causes of hypertension, a TSH as both hyper and hypothyroidism can be, a secondary, can be associated with a secondary cause of hypertension, a urinalysis, and an EKG. Optional testing include an echocardiogram, uric acid, and a urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. We do not recommend an echocardiogram because of the cost of the echocardiogram. If you see LVH on the EKG, it is there, but the echo is more sensitive, but it's a cost-effective reason that we're not recommending the echo at this time just for the diagnosis of hypertension. Although uric acid does associate itself the higher the uric acid, the more likely over time cardiovascular disease will occur. We do not treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia, so we're not recommending a uric acid at this time. And unless they're a diabetic or have chronic kidney disease, we're not recommending an albumin to creatinine ratio as a means of uh, measuring protein in the urine. What also is not new? lifestyle modification, non-pharmacologic interventions. In terms of non-pharmacologic interventions, trials have shown the benefit of lowering blood pressure among those with blood pressures 130 over 80 or greater through weight loss, a heart-healthy diet, the dietary approach to stop hypertension diet, sodium reduction, potassium supplementation, increased physical activity, and alcohol reduction. 
all of these are a class one level of evidence A recommendation. When we look at what can be achieved by these lifestyle interventions, in terms of weight loss, ideal body weight is the best goal, but we aim for at least a one kilogram reduction and expect about a one millimeter of mercury reduction in systolic pressure for every kilogram reduction in body weight. The impact can be about five millimeters if they're hypertensive or two to three millimeters if they're normotensive overall. In terms of the diet, we recommend the dietary approach to stop hypertension diet, which is rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and low-fat dairy products with a reduced content of saturated and total fat. In the African-American patient, also on a low-sodium diet, the impact can be quite striking with a reduction of 11 millimeters of mercury, systolic in the hypertensive, and three in the normotensive. In terms of dietary sodium, there's been a lot of controversy here, although the optimal goal is stated to be less than 1,500 milligrams. The guideline states that you should aim for at least a 1,000 milligram reduction in most adults, and that can lead in the hypertensive to about five to six reduction in millimeters of mercury, and the normotensive two to three millimeters of mercury. New to the guideline is the enhanced intake of dietary potassium, fruits and vegetables, a diet rich in potassium, and we're aiming for 3,500 to 5,000 milligrams per day, and you can see the reduction in blood pressure there. Also new is we're recommending not only aerobic physical activity for at least 30 minutes a day, 90 to 150 minutes per week to achieve a 65 to 75% heart rate increase um, in terms of heart rate reserve, but we're also recommending dynamic resistance and isometric resistance exercise, which also are associated with a reduction in blood pressure. And then finally, in terms of alcohol consumption, we want men to have no more than two drinks per day and women no more than one drink per day. And that drink would include 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, and 1.5 ounces of hard liquor. We want less than that. And you can see the effects on blood pressure. They are all class one level of evidence A recommendations. In summary, lifestyle modification or non-pharmacologic therapy is a class one recommendation in those with elevated blood pressure, 120 to 129 and less than 80 millimeters of mercury, and stage one hypertension, 130 to 139 or 80 to 89 millimeters of mercury, regardless of if they require antihypertensive drug therapy or not. And drug therapy is based on risk. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's talk about the risk and thresholds and targets for blood pressure reduction. First, I have to state we've been on a roller coaster ride concerning the blood pressure targets we've been recommending to clinicians over the past 15 years. And this still is a controversial roller coaster because we still have different organizations that are recommending different targets. We have recently recommended systolic targets in different populations at risk, including from the American College of Physicians and the American Association of Family Physicians in adults over 60 years of age, a target of less than 150 systolic blood pressure. In JNC7 in 2003, we recommended a target of less than 140 for all individuals, but in diabetics or those with chronic kidney disease, we did recommend a target of less than 130. So it's really been quite a variable target of blood pressure reduction based on the recommending organization. And in this slide, I've just contrasted some of this for you in those that are um, diagnosed with hypertension. You have the new guideline on the far left, the JNC7 on the far right, and you'll notice that the ACP and AAFP have not commented on this. Instead, they have commented on drug treatment for those not at high risk who are 60 years of age and older. And they're recommending a, a drug, drug treatment threshold at 150 systolic blood pressure for all patients with hypertension, 
other groups in the past had recommended 140 over 90, including JNC7, and even the ACC and AHA in patients not at risk. We'll talk about that in a minute. They're recommending less than 140 and less than 90 as the threshold for where you would consider drug therapy. So there still has been a difference. Now, in the evaluation of risk, we have a new risk estimator, and we're asked to use this risk estimator to estimate the 10-year risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in those without underlying cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, or stage 2 hypertension, 140 over 90 or greater. And you can download this um, on your computer on the first HTTP address or from the App Store, just searching for the ASCBD Risk Estimator Plus. And of course, it's important to remember that this estimator has been validated for adults 40 to 79 years of age. Here is the risk estimator, and you can see the address, and you can see what's required. You need to know the patient's gender, their age, their ethnicity, their total in HDL cholesterol, their systolic pressure. Are they on hypertensive meds? Are they a diabetic? And are they smoking? And this will calculate their 10-year risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Please note that this risk estimator is very age dependent and at patients with ages of 65 years of age and older, it often predicts a risk of 10% or more. That will make a lot of sense why that's important in a few minutes. Now, let's get to that and let's look at the thresholds for treatment. The 2017 guideline recommends the initiation of antihypertensive medication in all those with stage 2 hypertension, blood pressure of 140 over 90 or greater. But in those with stage 2 hypertension, drug therapy is recommended if they have a history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or a 10-year predicted ASCBD risk of 10% or more based on the risk estimator. In addition, those, as I stated, 65 years of age and older should still be placed into the risk estimator, but they often will also have an ASCVD risk of greater than 10%. This slide really puts it all into perspective. If you have a blood pressure of less than 120 over less than 80, you're normal, and you promote optimal lifestyle habits and reassess the patient in one year. If the individual has an elevated blood pressure, 120 to 129 systolic, less than 80 diastolic, you want to prevent them from becoming hypertensive. You're going to recommend lifestyle modification, non-pharmacologic therapy, and there you might reassess in three to six months. And that reassessment might be with home blood pressures that the patient might call back to you or you may see the patient in your office. If the individual has stage one hypertension, the important things here to note, does the patient have clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, or a 10-year risk of 10% or more from the risk estimator? If so, you continue lifestyle modification and you begin blood pressure lowering medication. If they do not have those with stage 1 hypertension, you continue lifestyle modification and once again, reassess in three to six months. The idea being that there will be a number of younger patients who have a lower than 10% risk estimate of cardiovascular risk, no ASCVD, chronic kidney disease, or diabetes, and will just be treated with lifestyle modification. If the patient has stage two hypertension, we initiate lifestyle and blood pressure lowering medication and we reassess in one month. And that's new to the guideline. That is, anytime we use medication or up titrate medication, we want to know the patient's blood pressure within one month, as most antihypertensives have the majority of their effect within four weeks of initiation of the therapy or the increase in dose. 
and that's in the guideline, adults initiating a new or adjusted drug regimen for hypertension should have a follow-up evaluation of adherence and response to treatment at monthly intervals until control is achieved. Now let's look at initial drug classes that are recommended for initiation of antihypertensive drug therapy as a 1A systematic review. First line agents include thiazide and thiazide like diuretics, calcium channel blockers, both dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines, and ACE inhibitors or ARBs, but not both. These three classes of drugs are recommended as initial therapy. That is a thiazide, thiazide-like diuretic, a CCB, and a RAS inhibitor. Beta blockers are not in the list. However, there are specific indications where you would consider a beta blocker, and these are listed here. So here is this triangle of the initial management and medication used for, the, for hypertension, a thiazide, thiazide-like diuretic, a calcium channel blocker, and an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Notice the asterisk. If the patient has stage 3 or higher, stage 2 or 1 CKD, or has significant clinical proteinuria, at greater than 300 milligrams per day, we recommend an ACE or an ARB as at least part of the initial cocktail, if not the initial therapy, but we discourage combining an ACE inhibitor and an ARB for the treatment of hypertension. And that gets a class three recommendation of HAR, combining an ACE inhibitor and an ARB. If the individual is African American, Unless they have heart failure or chronic kidney disease, where an ACE or an ARB might be recommended, we recommend for blood pressure reduction that you'll get more blood pressure reduction with a thiazide, thiazide-type diuretic, or a calcium channel blocker in the African-American as initial therapy for their hypertension. Once again, beta blockers should be included if there's a compelling indication. Otherwise, it is not one of the first three classes of drugs recommended. And that is so because when you look at the reduction in stroke, beta blockers have not done as well as the other classes for the treatment of hypertension and the reduction of stroke. What about starting with a single agent or combination therapy? <clears throat> well, the, the guideline states with a class one expert opinion, initiation of antihypertensive therapy with two first line agents of different classes either as separate agents or a fixed dose combination is recommended in adults with stage two hypertension and an average blood pressure more than 20 over 10 millimeters mercury above their target. You may start of course with a single antihypertensive agent and that would be reasonable in the second recommendation in adults with stage one hypertension and a blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80 with titration and sequential addition of other agents to reach the uh, blood pressure target. What should the target be? Well, the rationale for lowering the blood pressure levels used to define hypertension are based on observational data, randomized trials of lifestyle modification, and clinical trial data with antihypertensive medication to lower blood pressure and prevent cardiovascular disease. From a systematic review, from an external review committee, that was published outside the guideline, more intensive blood pressure lowering to less than 130 systolic goal versus a higher goal, significantly reduced MI by 14%, stroke by 23%, heart failure by 25%, and cardiovascular disease as a composite by 17%. So the committee believes that the systolic goal of less than 130 is a reasonable target for most patients with hypertension based on risk. And you'll notice when there's no clinical cardiovascular disease and the 10 year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk is less than 10% by the risk estimator, the threshold for beginning drugs is 140 over 90 or greater. The only other patient population where the threshold for drugs is 140 over 90 or greater is after the patient is stable for secondary stroke prevention. All other individuals are recommended to begin blood pressure at the threshold of 130 over 80 
to achieve a blood pressure goal on the far right of this slide, always at less than 130 over 80. Now let's look at some special populations. Let's look at the diabetic. And let's talk a little bit about diabetes because it's a controversial area, what the appropriate treatment and what the target should be. Hypertension is present in about 80% of U.S. adults with diabetes. Hypertension markedly increases their risk for cardiovascular disease events and mortality, twofold by the risk calculator. Importantly, no single randomized controlled trial supports a systolic blood pressure target of less than 130. However, systematic reviews do support this target and even lower targets, down to 120. And there's no randomized controlled trial evidence for a specific diastolic blood pressure threshold, the current diagnostic criteria for diabetes, including the heart study. Accord was underpowered and complicated by its factorial design. That said, there was a trend for benefit shown in subgroup analysis for the standard glycemic group, I'll show you this in a minute, and the intensive blood pressure control start, um, study arm. Nevertheless, the American Diabetes Association still recommends less than 140 over less than 90 as the target blood pressure. So it's a controversial area. When we look at the Accord blood pressure trial with 4,733 type 2 diabetics, breaking down into two groups, an intensive group trying to achieve a systolic of less than 120, they achieved 119.3 systolic, and the standard group, of less than 140 trying to achieve a blood pressure between 130 and 140, achieving a blood pressure of 133.5, there was no benefit in the primary endpoint. But stroke, a secondary endpoint, was reduced, but that was a secondary endpoint. And as you reduce blood pressure, there were increases in serum creatinine and changes in electrolytes. Here is the Accord five-year cardiovascular event rate by glycemia and blood pressure randomized subgroup. Notice that in the individuals that were in the intensive glycemic group at an A1C of less than 6%, this was the group that stopped this trial early because of an increased mortality trying to achieve that A1C. There was no difference between blood pressures, but when we try to achieve an A1C between 7 and 7.9%, as some organizations are recommending currently, there was a benefit to the intensive systolic reduction of less than 120 compared to less than 140. Remember, though, this is a retrospective subgroup analysis suggesting that the lower blood pressure is better. So the committee felt that a target of less than 130 was a reasonable target to try to um, approach the patient with diabetes. Now, the advanced blood pressure trial is another trial in 55 year of, an, of age patients and older with type 2 diabetes. And in this trial, there was a benefit going to less than 140, but notice the achieved in the intensive group was 136 compared to about 142 in the standard group. So less than 140 was beneficial, but they did not get on a mean of less than 130. And then finally, in the HOT trial, there were only 1,501 patients with diabetes. And in the overall trial, there was no benefit from the lower diastolic pressure. In subgroup analysis, the diabetics did benefit from a lower target, but this is a very controversial area. So some groups are recommending a diastolic of less than 80, others less than 90. In this meta-analysis, a network meta-analysis, 30 of the 42 trials, including type 2 diabetics, you can see that the lower blood pressure of 120 to 124 versus any other blood pressure favored the lower blood pressure. A progressive reduction in cardiovascular disease risk occurred at lower levels of achieved blood pressure, which was similar for stroke and coronary heart disease and all-cause mortality. And so some are using this meta-analysis to support the systolic blood pressure of less than 130. In summary, the guideline states with a class one recommendation 
for systolic and an S and a BR recommendation over the systematic review and an expert opinion on diastolic that in adults with diabetes and hypertension, antihypertensive drug sh treatment should be initiated at a blood pressure of 130 over 80 or higher with a treatment goal of less than 130 over 80. In addition, they recommend all first line classes of antihypertensive agents, diuretics, ACEs or ARBs and CCBs are useful and effective. And they say that in adults with diabetes and hypertension, ACEs or ARBs may be considered in the presence of albuminuria. The ADA in 2018 recommended that the blood pressure threshold should be 140 over 90, and you should try to achieve a blood pressure with a grade A recommendation of less than 140 and less than 90. Lower blood pressure targets, they said with expert opinion, might be appropriate in patients with high cardiovascular risk. First line medication classes include ACEs or ARBs, thiazide diuretics or CCBs. However, ACEs and ARBs should not be used together. And ACEs or ARBs are first line agents for hypertension with clinical proteinuria. And that's a grade A recommendation. Okay. Let's move on to chronic kidney disease. And here, the summary is that in adults with hypertension and chronic kidney disease, they once again believe the blood pressure goal should be less than 130 over less than 80. They go on to recommend in adults with hypertension and, st and CKD stage three or higher, or stage one or two with clinical proteinuria, albuminuria of 300 milligrams per day or more, or the equivalent in the first morning void treatment with an ACE inhibitor is reasonable to slow kidney disease. That's a 2A. And they say that as a 2B, treatment with an ARB may be reasonable if an ACE inhibitor is not tolerated. Remember, CKD has historically been excluded from clinical hypertension trials. Post hoc analysis of CKD trials have favored lower targets for patients with clinical proteinuria but not for patients with reduced estimated GFR. And no single study supported a systolic blood pressure target of less than 140 in patients with CKD until the SPRINT trial. SPRINT had 28% of their patients with stage three or four CKD. Their estimated GFR was 20 to less than 60 or 20 to 59. Meta-analyses, including CKD patients and SPRINT patients, support intensive systolic targets to reduce cardiovascular events, but not renal events. So we don't have good evidence that lowering systolic pressure will lead to an improvement in reduction of estimated GFR. But patients with CKD are most likely to die of cardiovascular events, and these are the same events that are prevented with lower blood pressure in the SPRINT trial. So intensive targets are associated with a reduction and not improvement in estimated GFR. So if you're targeting a patient with chronic kidney disease to less than 130, follow the patient's renal function closely. Now let's look at older patients. These are patients 65 years of age who are non-institutionalized. They walk into the SPRINT trial their community living adults. Here, the target once again and threshold are 130 and less than 130. In terms of older patients, age-related issues, class 1A recommendation, treatment of hypertension with a systolic treatment goal of less than 130 is recommended for non-institutionalized ambulatory community-dwelling adults greater than 65 years of age with an average systolic pressure of 130 or higher. For older adults with hypertension and high comorbidity, non-ambulatory, living in a nursing home, and or limited life expectancy, clinical judgment, patient preference, and a team-based approach to assess risk benefit is reasonable for decisions regarding the intensity of blood pressure lowering and choice of antihypertensive drugs. Once again, this is the informed clinical judgment that you bring in knowing your patient better than anyone. Remember in the SPRINT trial, we had two targets, 
double blindly randomized to an intensive group or a standard group, less than 120, less than 140. The same blood pressure medications were utilized. These patients had to be at least 50 years of age. They had a systolic blood pressure of 130 to 180, and 28% of them were, 65, were 75 years of age or older. The exclusion criteria included being non-ambulatory and living in a nursing home. In addition, because other trials were looking at stroke and the ACCORD trial looked at diabetics, these patients were excluded, as were patients with clinical heart failure, proteinuria of one gram per day or more, where we know that an ACE or an ARB is beneficial in those patients and blood pressure reduction is beneficial. We uh, excluded patients with an estimated GFR of less, than one, of less than 20 and anyone that had problems with adherence anywhere in their chart. We wanted patients that were ambulatory, not living in a nursing home, and were adherent to their medications. Now, in those 75 years of age and older, the intensive blood pressure arm of less than 120 was uh, associated with a 34% reduction in the primary outcome stated there on the bottom of the slide and a reduction in all-cause mortality. So elderly patients at less than 120 lived longer than patients randomized to a less than 140. It did not matter the frailty status of the patient, be they fit, less fit, or frail, those randomized to the intensive blood pressure grouping did better. In terms of um, side effects, in terms of electrolytes, there was a reduction in sodium, but there was no difference in orthostatic hypotension in those relegated to the intensive less than 120 group compared to the standard less than 140 group. So in summary, in treating older people with hypertension, the guideline states a systolic blood pressure goal of less than 130 is recommended for non-institutionalized ambulatory, community-dwelling, high-risk adults with an average systolic pressure of 130 or greater. If a goal of less than 130 is chosen in sprint-like patients, renal function, evaluation for hypotension, and electrolyte abnormalities need to be watched more carefully. We must be vigilant if we're going to take our older patients to a lower blood pressure systolic target. In older patients with hypertension, a high comorbidity burden, and limited life expectancy. Your clinical judgment, the patient's preference, and a team-based approach to assess risk-benefit is reasonable for shared decisions regarding the intensity of blood pressure lowering and the choice of antihypertensive drugs. So what in patients in adults 40 years of age and older, what are the benefits and the trade-offs of trying to achieve this new ACC AHA 2017 target of less than 130 over less than 80. Well, using data from the NHANES 2013-2016 blood pressure clinical trials and population-based cohort studies, Bundy et al. published this just this past year, that by achieving the lower target, there would be a reduction in cardiovascular events reduced and a reduction in total deaths. Yes, there will be more hypotensive events and more acute kidney injury, but you can see that the number needed to treat is much more favorable for reducing cardiovascular events and total deaths than for get, seeing the morbidity of hypotension or an elevation in BUN and creatinine with acute kidney injury, which can be reversible by backing off on the blood pressure reduction. So overall, there are those that feel this new target is a welcomed recommendation, yet there's still controversy with the, AC, with the a, ACP and AFP, American College of Physicians and American Family Physicians, that still think that less than 140 over less than 90 in higher risk patients, and perhaps even in patients 60 years of age and older, less than 150 is still a reasonable target. Controversy continues.
The last line of the guideline states this document is, as its name implies, a guide. In managing patients, the responsible clinician's judgment remains paramount. So what are my take-home messages? One, don't be in a rush to label patients as being hypertensive. Two, multiple office and home measurements are necessary before you diagnose or treat patients for their abnormal blood pressure. Three, accuracy of blood pressure measurement in the office and securing a diagnosis with accurate home measurement is of paramount importance to the future of your patient's care. Four, all patients benefit from lifestyle modification. Five, it's not just about your blood pressure number. Risk assessment needs to occur using the ASCVD risk estimator in those with hypertension and no ASCVD, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, or stage two hypertension. This will determine if drug therapy is required in addition to non-pharmacologic treatment. In older and higher risk hypertensive populations, as done in SPRINT, if a lower blood pressure goal is chosen, less than 130, Check renal function and electrolytes more regularly as you reduce blood pressure. How you measure blood pressure is a key determinant to what your target blood pressure should be. Timely intensification of blood pressure medication monthly is recommended to avoid clinical inertia. <coughs> Get your patients involved and, if necessary, their families involved with a shared decision treatment plan. Informed, shared decision-making is imperative in implementing the 2017 ACC AHA Hypertension Guideline. And finally, a team-based approach is recommended to improve blood pressure control, including home measurement, pharmacist-assisted, and other multidisciplinary healthcare provider input. You remember in A Few Good Men, Jack Nicholson gets on the stand and says, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. Well, the truth is defined in who is looking at what, which clinical trials. What I've tried to present to you is the way the 2017 ACC AHA Guideline Committee looked at the truth and why they believe less than 130 over less than 80 is, an, is a reasonable target for high risk in all patients with hypertension, not using drug therapy in those at lower risk up to a threshold of 140 over 90, but in higher risk patients, including the special populations we talked about, trying to achieve a blood pressure of less than 130 over less than 80. And I want to thank you for listening. I hope this has been helpful, and I hope you have success with your patients having hypertension. Thank you very much.